Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who loves the power of just keeping it together. Here is the captain. Yeah, the power of drugs. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. We are still drinking S'more Stout by Untitled Art out of Wisconsin. S'more Stout is a pastry stout with vanilla beans, candy syrup, and milk sugar, ABV, 8% garage grade, four and a half bottle caps out of five. And here's some cheers to our good friends that helped us out with this week's beer run. First up, it cheers to Melissa in Harrells, North Carolina. A big we like to jib to Madeline in Madison, Wisconsin. And here's one from Elena H. in Parts Unknown. Big shout out to Carmen in Marshalltown, Iowa. Next up, Captain, we have a cheers to Carrie in Marina Del Rey, California. And last but certainly not least, we have Jessica at State College, PA. Everyone we just mentioned helped us out with this week's beer fund. And for that, we thank you. Yeah, B W E W R U N Beer Run. Don't be a douche canoe. Yes, I'm talking to you. Sign up for our bonus show for your earballs called Off the Record on Stitcher Premium. If you don't do it, use a loser. You can find a link at truecrimegarage.com. And, Colonel, that is enough of the business. All right, everybody. Gather around. Grab a chair. Grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. When we left off yesterday, Captain, we left off with that strange text that was sent from Chase to his aunt. She responds asking if he's okay and then receives no answer from Chance. Now, Chance's mom said that he did not use emojis, and so she's very suspicious of this text. She believes that someone else had his phone at this time. Now that we have a little bit more information About the timeline, let's go through it in a clear and concise manner before we move on. So, based off of all reports, sometime between 7.20 and 7.30 p.m., Chance left his in-law's residence at the 700 block of O Street. At 7.45, he calls his friend Matt asking for a ride. Again, Matt is several hours away. This doesn't seem feasible. One minute later, 746, he talks to Bailey, this for the last time. He tells her that he is walking south, and as you and I pointed out yesterday, Captain, that is not accurate. So either he is fibbing to her, doesn't want her to find him, or he is lost already at this point. Just a short 16 to 26 minutes into his walk. At 749... He's seen walking past Domino's Pizza and Gehring heading towards Scott's Bluff. This is at the intersection of 10th Avenue and Stable Club Road. 7.51 p.m. Last seen on video walking by himself at the intersection of Terry Boulevard and Stable Club Road in Terrytown. This is the last confirmed sighting of Chance. 8.45 p.m. Last time, friends or family members spoke to him. Unclear whether he actually responded to any of them or whether they could just see that the text were read. 9.08 p.m. That is the strange text from Chance's phone to his aunt. 9 to 9.15 p.m. approximately. This is when the significant thunderstorm struck the area. Approximately 9 p.m. His phone pinged in the vicinity of Al Road, south of the Western Travel Terminal convenience store. The data comes from an arc, that's the police's term, an arc that is a couple miles long, covering an area encompassing Scotts Bluff National Monument property in Garing to West 25th Street in Scotts Bluff. So a large area there. And at approximately 9.15 p.m., the phone shut off for whatever reason. Now, it's worth noting that the timeline is longer than the amount of time necessary for Chance to walk the distances he is believed to have traveled. It would only take him 
about an hour to walk to the area of the WTT truck stop, for example. No one knows where he was or what he was doing in the two and a half hours between when he left and his last phone ping. It sounds to me, though, Captain, that Chance is probably only vaguely familiar with this area. So if I'm the investigator on this case, I have a couple of questions. I want to see who saw him at the golf course. Did anybody see this confrontation happen? I don't think there's any other eyewitness other than Bailey that says Chance was at the grandparents' house and left from the grandparents' house. I don't believe there was any other family member that actually saw him there. Again, like you said, there's gaps in the timeline. That's a big question for me. Another question, why didn't Bailey try to contact him by phone after their last conversation? At that point, she would have had some communication with his family. Why wouldn't you try to call his phone? Why wouldn't you try to text? Well, to be clear... She did. Um, it's just she never speaks to him again after that marker that we gave in the in the timeline. Yeah, but I think her. if you look at her phone records or maybe it was his phone records, I don't think she actually tried to call him after it got dark and once the storm happened. You think at, the, at some point when they claimed that they stopped searching for him because the storm got so bad, you think during that whole time that you're searching for him in the storm that you'd be trying to call his phone, and, and I, I haven't seen the records of any phone calls being made after it got dark. Also, you have the lake, the river. Those have to come into play based off of his location. Also, like you brought up, this mysterious text. Was it just a butt dial, or was there something more to it? Well, and you bring up a good point here. Now, you know, remembering that Bailey told Chance's parents that they had stopped looking for him because there was this storm. So one, I think we want to take a look at the storm first. So we have the U.S. National Weather Service that issued a severe thunderstorm warnings for that night. So we know this storm happened, right? That's not in question. And we know that it was a, a pretty severe storm, this given by the standard of the National Weather Service. So they issued warnings for this storm an estimated winds up to 60 mile an hour with penny size hail. A flash flood warning was issued until 1 a.m. on July 7th. Remember, he walks off, according to Bailey's story, 720 to 730 on July 6th. And sure enough, there was a very significant storm that night, right in the area where Chance's phone last pinged. Information we found shows that the Scotts Bluff estimated that gusts of wind were in the 70 mile per hour range. So trees were downed and one entire outbuilding blew away. The whole thing didn't last that long though. So starting a roughly around 9 PM and ending by 10 PM, but the storm dropped more than an inch of rain in that short time period. Bailey said she figured that chance took shelter in a nearby bar or some kind of building And when she woke up the next morning and he still wasn't there, this is when she knew it was really bad. So being perfectly authentic here, Captain, I, I had some, some concerns about the statement of, well, we stopped looking for him because the storm was coming in. That is just a poorly written sentence that made me super suspicious because I mean, think about any situation where you're trying to locate someone or a lost dog or anything like that. Do you, wouldn't the storm heighten your senses and increase you wanting to find this person sooner, even if it's in the course of the storm? Yeah, that's where I think there would be frantic text messages and frantic calls saying, hey, look, whatever we were arguing about at this point doesn't matter. Tell us where you're at so we can come get you. You know, We can deal with this later. And so reporting in, in that way to me is – it's just not, it's just bad. It's just bad work right there. And the, the reason being is because the rest of the story seems to be that she's telling his parents at 11 PM, Hey, we stopped looking for him because the storm was so bad. So if the storm starts at nine, nine 15, she's saying this at 11. So there's a good chance that they were still looking for him during the course of 
the early parts of that storm, if not the entirety of it. And it's also reasonable to believe if you're a searcher or even one of us on the outside looking in to say, yes, it seems likely that he would have taken shelter somewhere once this storm rolled in and there that's going to hinder our chances of finding him. And so of course we called off the search at some point. So where, where that miss, where that bad reporting in the beginning of my research really raised some red flags for me after reviewing the story in more detail, I don't think so anymore. I, I don't really question the movements of, of Bailey and his, her family, according to what we're being told yeah, from if Bailey. The, if they family. actually searched. And again, we, we, we don't know that. <laughs> we don't know that a hundred percent. Again, I still question if you're making contact with his family, why aren't you trying to make contact with him? But also when we talk about missing person cases, a lot of times it's okay. Well, he was off and he was in this bad storm but like his friend says, what his best friend says, Matt Miller, you know, this guy's not an idiot. You know, Matt seems to have a, a pretty good head on his shoulders. He's saying, look, if, if something happened where uh, he died in that storm, you're more likely to find the body. Mother Nature is not going to dig a hole and then toss him into a grave. If something happened to him, you know, where he got, you know, maybe a tree fell over and hit him or whatever you would find his body. Mm -hmm. uh, they have not been able to do that. Now, I, I do kind of disagree with Matt Miller and and Chance's mother as far as, like, you, you don't know how you'd react. I mean, look, 70-mile-an-hour winds, that's tough. And I don't know if anybody's been outside when it hails, but that can be a rough situation too. Is it possible that you go to the banks of you know the lake or the banks of the river to try to find some kind of shelter, you're swept into one of the lakes or rivers. I think as far as in, if I was in charge of this investigation, the river's pretty big, obviously, and there's some very deep parts. I don't know if you could exhaust that theory, but I think you could exhaust the theory of whether he went into that lake or not. It's you know still a decent-sized lake, but I think... With the proper search teams, you could get to the bottom of if he was in that lake or not. Well, and that was some of the concern because we have the police that have even stated that in that much rain, referring to the storm that occurred that night, there is a possibility that people can slip into rushing streams and rivers. And there was apparently a flash flood warning in that very area that night. But I have read multiple online posts that the North Platte River in Nebraska is not swift or dangerous. But, you know, you have to wonder, could Chance have ended up in the river? Remember, his phone did show that he was in the area of the North Platte right around the time that the storm hit. What they're saying online is true. It's not known as this raging river, but it would have been higher than it ever was, and it would probably been moving faster than it ever was at that time period. We should also point out, too, that even though the official searches ended after about six days or so looking for Chance, that the searches conducted by volunteers and Bailey and her family and Chance's family and friends, those continued on and on uh, for a good amount of time. In fact, it was just, I believe, the following weekend that they had about 30 to maybe 40 family members and friends that were out there looking in those same areas. And in fact, branching out into neighboring towns that may not have been searched previously and even across state lines into Torrington, Wyoming, which is interesting because that's basically where he says that he was heading right. that night when he speaks with his friend, Matt. And these were pretty organized searches from my understanding. We had people on horseback, people on foot, and people on ATVs all out there looking. And some of them were out there looking from sun up to sun down. And unfortunately, again, in this situation, they end up finding nothing. And I mean nothing. It's not, it's not we didn't find chance. It's we didn't find any sign of him. Well, I his think, personal belongings, his phone, nothing. Right. And I think you'd agree with this statement. And tell me if you do or or don't 
by there being a storm, you also become more vulnerable at possibly getting into a vehicle that you normally wouldn't get into. Tell them Large Marge sent you. That's, that is a concern, too. When you see the uh, the thunder rolling in and the, the, the lightning starts hitting and even hail at some point. Yeah, you sing it, Garth Brooks. Yeah, you might be willing to get into a uh, big rig that you wouldn't have before that that storm starts. And who knows? Maybe by this point he feels like he's struck out with – with friends trying to get a ride from them and he's desperate and he just wants to get to, to Torrington or, or he just wants to get anywhere out of that area, uh, or just in from the storm. Well, yes, he's reaching out to his family and friends for help, but what he knows more than anybody knows well, he's, is he's, once his phone dies, right? He's reaching out to his friends for help. Right, right. There right. seems to be no indication that he reached out to family. In fact, it seems like there's a chance that he may have ignored calls or text from family on purpose after reaching out to Matt. Right. Um, so now let's talk about Matt a little bit more here. Um, what we have here, Captain, in the weeks and months that passed after Chance goes missing, eventually Bailey's going to return to Moorcroft. She does start attending nursing school as planned uh, or maybe delayed. I'm a little confused on that timeline. The house, remember they had rec- recently purchased a home. Right. That was foreclosed on after some time. Chance's friend, Matt Miller, who we've been discussing quite a bit, he, the two of them were going to start that job together on that Monday. And Chance goes missing. Now, Matt's working three weeks on and one week off. That's his schedule. What he did was he took to returning to Garing to that area in his week off to search for his friend. And then he ultimately started a Facebook page called Let's Start with Chance that organized grassroots searches for Chance over the period of several months. These are all well-executed searches using borrowed drone equipment and getting permission from even private landowners to search their properties. Again, These may be properties that were previously unsearched. Mm -hmm. Again, no trace of chance has ever been found. And I felt like I'm constantly defending Bailey on this, but a lot of people online have have given her flack because she hasn't done a lot of interviews. And and now, two years later, when news agencies and, uh, and journalists and maybe even podcasters reach out to her, she's not doing any interviews. What her claims are is that her family has received some threats um, based off some of the interviews that she has done, and so she doesn't want to put her family through that. But also it could just be that people misunderstand or or take your statements in, in whatever direction they want to. I would just go back with the lead investigator when he says she was interviewed, everybody in her family was interviewed, and they were all cooperative, and he said that th- their properties were searched as well. Yeah, and I'm glad that you point that out because sometimes when people duck media, they duck the newspapers or podcasts, they're, they're thrown into a bad light of, well, they must be guilty of something because they don't want to have to tell their story too many times because they might get tripped up on something. We can only go with what the experts say, and, and Captain, you're exactly right. The expert here is this investigator Eats, and this is a direct quote. She, meaning Bailey, she's always been very cooperative with me, very cordial. Interviewed her at length. My first interview with her was probably a couple hours long, so she's always been very cooperative, end quote. Yeah, she she made a claim of, about saying that she was cleared and other people were cleared, that's that's actually not accurate. Um, maybe law enforcement told them, hey, you guys aren't suspects at this time. Who knows? But until they find them, they're not going to clear anybody. And that's just right. that's just the, the smart thing to do. Well, and there's no need to clear anybody because there's no indication of foul play, as pointed out by law enforcement. And then you have the flip side of that coin that they go on to very quickly point out that there's – no evidence that there wasn't foul play. So a very uh, a, a very mysterious situation here. Now, 
what we have that I wanted to get into here, Captain, is an update. We we had an update. So we mentioned the the Facebook page that mm-hmm. was put together. And about four months after Chase vanished, his family issued a pretty lengthy statement on the Facebook page. I'm not going to go through all of it. It's still available online for people to read. Again, it's about four months after he went missing. The reason why I'm not going to go into all of it is because a lot of it is repetitive of of things we've already covered within this case. But I do want to address some of the issues that they addressed in their their statement. And this is interesting to me because it seems to address some of the rumors that were going on at the time. So about halfway through their post, it says there are two different video surveillance type recordings of Chance walking that his family... Again, these are all their words that his family and they are specific here, his mother, father, brothers, and wife. So all five of them are fairly confident that this is chase. He is upright walking with purpose and determination. And the five of them say the same thing that he does not appear to be drunk or in any way impaired. Now, again, as captain pointed out, that is certainly up for debate. Yeah, we will agree to disagree. They go on to address Another issue here. The phone did ping near the WTT truck stop in Scotts Bluff, which means that it was within tower range of an arced area. They're using that same terminology that the police was using during this specific time. This fits the timeline and description of what was stated above. This does not mean, and they, they want to be very clear here in this statement, this does not mean that he was actually ever at the truck stop. They go on to address the cement rumor, saying the cement, yes, this was poured the week Chance went missing. This is not a new development. Chance's family was aware, and this has been investigated fully to their satisfaction. Again, we pointed out that it sounds like what the police were saying, that this was debunked pretty early on in the investigation. Cement was poured. A family friend or somebody that knows Bailey's family So, of course, the rumor was, well, he must be under there, and they poured the cement to cover it up. It appears that everyone agrees that that is not what happened and that they are satisfied with that result. They go on to address the cell phone. Now, this is not Chance's cell phone. This is an interesting little rumor here that was going on. It says the cell phone left on Chance's and Bailey's porch at their home in Moorcroft. That's what they're addressing. They say this cell phone belonged to a homeless guy. It was fully investigated by the DCI. While, yes, Matt was en route, another good friend of Chance's, who is also a neighbor, went and picked it up so that nothing happened to the phone and it could be turned over to the police. So I guess some random phone was found on their porch and this phone was collected by somebody and turned over to police they have figured out, no, this is not Chance's phone. Well, and just like Bailey's family has been pretty cooperative with the police, it seems like Chance, Chance's family has been equally as cooperative with the police. Yeah, and I've heard his mom say that, you know, she'll call frequently asking for updates in the case, as will other family members of Chance's. But in this statement, they do say some nice things about police, and their statement reads, Law enforcement everywhere, including in Garing, is overworked and underpaid. We believe they have done the best they could with what they had. There are things that everyone questions, such as where is county, state, and federal agencies? Why haven't they done more or X, Y, Z? To be honest, no one knows for certain what has or hasn't been done because this is an open, ongoing investigation and they can't tell us everything. But that doesn't mean we can't continue to search and spread the word until Chance is brought home. We are back. 
you filthy animals. And if you're nasty, make sure you subscribe to Off the Record. Cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers to you. And Mr. Captain, nasty. This is about the same time that the family releases their statement. We get a press release from the Garing Police Department. They did a media release of their own. And again, they're reiterating most of what we have already covered. The most important portion of their statement was in regard to the cell tower information. So I'll read that portion. And this is verbatim here. It says, there was a lot of information floating around that Chance's phone last pinged at WTT in Scotts Bluff. This information is not correct. Chance's phone last communicated with a tower near Riverview Golf Course just west of Scotts Bluff. Because of cell phone technology, the information did not greatly narrow down the area Chance may have last used his cell phone. The last time Chance's phone was used was shortly after 9 p.m. on July 6, 2019, in an area two to three miles south to southeast of that tower. I like that portion of the statement because it's very specific, even though it still leaves a wide range of space where he could have been, two to three miles. It goes on to say that starting July 8th, the Garing Police Department and several other agencies and volunteers conducted searches in the areas that cell phone information showed Chance's phone was pinged. So searching a very large area. They mention all of the resources and equipment used in the searches and state that as of November 27th, 2019, no evidence or traces of Chase Engelbert have been discovered. The release also states that they have been able to follow up on dozens of tips and information that have come in. So lots of tips are coming in. They're letting us know they followed up on them. Investigators have also followed up on dozens of potential sightings of chance in numerous states, including Colorado, Wyoming, South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, Texas, and Missouri. The law enforcement agencies in the jurisdictions where the potential sightings were were reported, have assisted in looking at video and other requests made of them. Thus far, none of the potential sightings have resulted in any useful information that will bring us closer to finding out what happened to Chance. So at least they are receiving some tips, especially at that point in the timeline within the first four months that he was missing. And as stated, these are in multiple states across this great country and they're contacting those jurisdictions. The jurisdictions have been cooperative and did their investigation. And unfortunately, they're not finding chance either. Like I said, I, I like the demeanor of the lead investigator, Brian, Brian Eads, which I believe he actually worked for the FBI at some point. But he was saying that during this investigation that they've had uh, times that they have, have used the FBI as a resource and um, different FBI agents from different states. And basically when he goes through the list during his interview, he mentions, I don't know, five or six different agencies that they've worked with. I, I do want to put out that, that, uh, you know, Bailey has kind of said that, look, the, they didn't take this serious from the beginning and, and maybe that would have changed some things, but Look, a lot of these departments are underfunded, and this is July 4th weekend. There is a lot of calls. I think it's like the the most domestic violence calls are normally over the July 4th weekend. That's because I'm out in the streets raising hell. Just beating everybody. No, but here's the thing. When, when that is said by Bailey, I want to counter that with the fact that she didn't call to report him missing until the following morning. Yeah. So she can question how they reacted once they received the information at 11 a.m. on Sunday. But keep in mind, that's news to them at 11 a.m. on Sunday when, according to her, he went he went a walk in at 7.30 p.m. on Saturday. They don't have much communication or she doesn't have much communication with him after about 20 or 30 minutes after he's gone, a bad storm comes in around 9 p.m. They call off the dogs and quit looking for him at some point between 9 and 11 p.m. And then they wait a full 12 hours to report him missing. So I'm not trying to point the finger, but if you're going to say, well, they didn't take it super serious 
from Jump Street. Well, I don't think you and your family took it super serious from Jump Street either. And I don't really blame Bailey's family or the police department for not taking it super serious from Jump Street. No, I, I definitely don't blame them. I, I question why wasn't there more urgency because of the severity of this storm. Right. And I, I hope that it's not a situation of Bailey and her family saying, you know what? Well, he's, he's a real jerk and he stormed out of here and he said some things to us or me that I didn't like. And if he wants to stand out there in the freezing rain, well, so be it. You know, I hope that that's not the situation. I hope that they did continue to look for him and at some point decided, you know what? He probably took shelter somewhere. We cannot make him answer his phone and we have to go home at some point. I, I sincerely hope that that's the situation. I do want to make sure, too, as we're going through some of these posts and these media statements and releases from the Garing Police Department, you know, and we kind of hitting some of the highlights, if you will, of their statements rather than rehashing everything that we've covered so far. They do end these statements with reminding the public that this is an open, ongoing investigation. They're still looking for chance. They're not going to press any charges should they find him. He's not done anything wrong, but also the reminder that if you believe you have seen him or if for some reason you believe you know what has happened to him, that you should call the Garing Police Department at 308-436-5089. We will have that phone number in the show notes uh, for today's and yesterday's show. And they also say that you could contact the Garing Police Department via Facebook. So there's the, there's your ways to pass along any information. And, you know, the Captain and I always say the same thing. Don't sit around and wonder if what you have is, is good information or bad information. Give it to them. Let them decide. If you think you saw something or if you heard a rumor, some trucker picked up a cowboy somewhere in the area of Garing in July of, of 2019 and something went down, Pass that information along to the appropriate people. There are, e- even with the the difficulties that were going on with Bailey's family and Chance's family, there are people there that are hurting, and they're hurting bad. And there, there's a son that is missing his father. And there is a wife that is missing the answers uh, of what happened to, to her husband. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things with Eads, One of the things he said, and I find this very telling, they have multiple stories of a robbery going wrong. Mm -hmm. Multiple stories. Now they have they have no evidence for or against. These are tips that have come in. And what's interesting about this, Captain, and I know you're going to get to it, but what's interesting to me about this is multiple stories coming in. That yes, they have some different details within those stories, but there's a lot of similarities too. And yeah, you, it's, you tell it because you tell it better anyway. No, I, I think I think you will. But uh, I just have I reviewed some some pretty short information that Eads had stated. We've received those tips. We're looking into it because there are similarities in some of these tips that have come in. Yeah. So basically, you know, maybe the the set of people in the rumor is the same, but the details are different on how it went down. And this would be a robbery gone wrong i guess right that, right that someone or some ones attempted to rob this man chance who was seen walking alone yeah and it seems as if uh the way eads is saying it is that we've been able to contact and interview and investigate these leads all from the perimeter where it's always well yeah i heard that rumor from so and so and and then they track down the so and so and then they go well i heard that rumor from this other person and they haven't really been able to find or investigate and do interviews and, and possibly polygraph test the actual individuals of the story. If that makes any sense. I know that sounds a little fuzzy. Well, I love fuzzy and I love the captain. And so what I'm thinking that that means, what that says to me, captain, is that there is some kind of breadcrumb trail, just either they're missing the first few breadcrumbs to to pick up the trail or they're missing the last few in the series. So there's something, it's not a complete picture for them to fully investigate and, and figure out exactly if these tips are in fact extremely valuable to their investigation. 
I want to discuss the different theories. We we touched on this earlier and asked you to think about the possibilities of what could have happened to Chance as we went through his life, his social circles, and the events leading up to his disappearance, and even some of the actions and behaviors after he went missing. So let's circle back and revisit each one of these now that we all have a good amount of knowledge on the case and a complete picture of the story or as much as one can gather. So the first possibility, first theory here would be some type of misadventure theory, right? As the Garing police chief pointed out in one of his posts, his media releases, the last ping from Chance's cell almost perfectly aligned with the arrival of the intense storm. Could Chance have died in an accident caused by the elements? I think this, to me, raises some big questions because it it seems a little too much of a coincidence that roughly the same time that this terrible storm comes in, his phone is no longer working. It, it seems to line up too, too much for me. It's a little too much on the nose in this situation to go much further past that, to say that this is not... A possibility. You have to consider the storm to be a strong possibility here, in my opinion. So that would lead you to things like drowning in the river, right? If Chance was walking near the river in the dark, in the rain, could he have lost his footing and fallen in and drowned in the rushing waters? This would explain the abrupt shutoff of his phone. Perhaps his body has not been found because it's wedged somewhere. The counter argument to this though would be that chance was an avid swimmer and an incredibly experienced outdoorsman and an athlete he was very familiar with hazardous weather and what not to do and the north platte river in nebraska is not exactly the mississippi but as the captain pointed out that night it could be raging it could be faster flowing than normal if chance drowned i do think though that we would have found him by now just because we've reviewed this in other cases and it always seems to me that the body surfaces at some point or somebody finds them at some point. And it's been a long time. Uh, it's been a long time since I left you with a dope beat to step two. Yeah. Look, like I said before, and I'll say it again, I don't know if you could exhaust all options on finding out what happened to him. If he fell into the river or something happened with the river because of the size, but I think you could do that with the lake and I think that's where I would exhaust options there. So I could at least rule it out. If we're talking about misadventure, the other thing to consider is hypothermia. You know, it's a possibility, and the police expressed some concern about this in their investigation, in their statements. Now, that would mean that Chance became soaked in the storm and his body temperature dropped to a dangerous level. Again, it's not really clear how familiar Chance was with this area. I'm guessing kind of vaguely, uh, but the direction he was heading in based off of the phone information is toward the national park. So totally unsettled and vast. Could he have died somewhere and he just has simply not been found? You know, we have Philip Krasick, the ultra marathoner in California just this past summer, died under a tree and wasn't found by searchers who later were saying that they had been within 300 feet of him the whole time looking for him. Now, remember that gibberish text that he sent to his aunt at 908. Could he have been disoriented already at this time? And he's, he's trying to convey that to his aunt. I, I call into question that like my counter argument to that portion is, is, is a, is a couple of things. One, this was July. So it only got down to 56 or 57 degrees that night. So would that have been cold enough for this situation to be probable? Well, maybe possibly with the 70 mile hour winds. The other thing too is with him being disoriented with that text, I lean toward toward two different thoughts with that text. Either Dawn is correct and somebody else had his phone, or this may have been some kind of butt dial or pocket text that was sent that really has no significance to the case at all, other than we know his phone was still on and active at that time. Yeah. And I say that because if we are going to 
when when exploring this possibility, we're saying that there's it's possible that the storm disoriented chance in some form or fashion. This text is at 908. The storm comes in shortly after 9 p.m. Right. Would this have been enough time for him to it's almost like you have to become disoriented immediately, like <laughs> within a matter of just a couple of minutes, which I don't think somebody in his physical I don't know that he would have become disoriented that quickly unless uh, unless he was already disoriented because he was intoxicated. Yeah, now, I know it's an open investigation, but God damn it, I want some information. Maybe it's not going to help solve the case, but I want it for myself. There's speculation online that they didn't even go golfing, that this golf trip never happened. So, Well, that would be a bit of a red flag. That's definitely a red flag. So if I'm an investigator, I'm going... I want to make sure that happened. And then on top of that, if you have his credit card information and you're saying that everybody in the family and everybody in Bailey's family is being cooperative with you, I want their bank statements. I want to know how many drinks were bought. I respect his best friend, Matt Miller. But Matt Miller was possibly intoxicated during that conversation. I don't want to take anybody's word for anything. On that video footage, I see a man that looks like he's trying to catch his balance from making a 90-degree turn. I, I agree, but we do have several people that say that say they see it differently than, than you and I, and they do know him better than we do. Now, I'm not saying that we're wrong. I agree with you. I see somebody that doesn't appear to be totally sober, but I don't think he looks to be as drunk as Brian Schaefer did in his uh, surveillance footage, footage video. But if I'm an investigator and they probably know this information and obviously they don't have, they don't have to share uh, this information with the public. But if I'm the investigator, that's why I want, I want to get, know, did this golfing event happen? What was the argument really about? Uh, did he actually argue with uh, Bailey? Did anybody see him at the grandmother's house and how much booze was in his system well and all all of that too is very difficult and i can only speak to my own experience so i don't know how everybody else is but i know with me alcohol can be a dangerous thing because i my body does not always react the same way every single time there's been times where i've had a couple drinks and i'm quite quite toasted and there's other times where i can drink all day and night and feel like i'm pretty sober you know lightly buzzed so but he's still toasted it's well you say that but i i'm telling you my experience and i don't know that we i don't what i'm getting at is i don't know that we could look at a list of what was consumed or purchased and know what was consumed by who and what quantities affect people in certain ways of course if we're seeing a large amount of, of booze then we could make the assumption that that maybe he was messed up. Regardless of that, though, Captain, we do know from the surveillance footage that he was alive at those times later that that evening. Again, you you are absolutely right. If the information we're being provided is incorrect about what was going on before he walked away or went missing, that brings up a whole different set of scenarios and a whole different bit of problems for the people that are telling us that he was golfing and telling us that he rode back to the grandparents' house before walking off. The other things we need to consider, a possible suicide. Uh, we know from too many tragic cases, there are many times when someone takes their own life and the family does not see it coming or they're not found for a long period of time. You're right. One doesn't uh, kill themselves and then dig a hole and bury themselves. But we have reviewed cases of bodies being found where they're not found for several years later, and it was an obvious suicide that is later determined. Foul play is a possibility, as pointed out by law enforcement and his family. His family seems to believe that this is the most likely scenario for the most part. For example, Chance's grandmother said, quote, in my mind, somebody has done something to him and somebody knows what's been done to him and someone has hidden him very well. And Chance's mom said she believes that somebody did something to him and she believes someone else had his phone at some point. 
Or along that same lines of foul play, did he, did Chance by some strange bad luck come in contact with the wrong person or persons who did something nefarious to him for unknown reasons? And it has been said that there is a significant contingent of people who believe that Bailey's family was responsible. And that theory would go something like this. Bailey and Chance were not getting along and their families also not getting along. Chance also lost his job and Bailey's family wasn't too happy about this. There's some type of argument after golf. And when Chance stalked off in a tantrum, walking away from his wife and baby, maybe Bailey's male relatives went after him and took care of things. Uh, we should point out how strange or preposterous this would seem to be. As people have pointed out, Bailey's family is a normal one, not a bunch of criminals with records of violent histories. But, you know, there is the possibility that if they did find chance and the argument continued and ex and escalated, yeah. when they, you know, they told him to man up and get back to Bailey and his baby, what if a fight breaks out and he's killed, you know, by accident or otherwise? But then that leads us to the situation of Bailey's relatives would have to have disposed of his body, returned home, and then no one outside of the family is any the wiser. Look, I get a little pissed off, though. You poor concrete. And they go, well, well, we looked into that, and we don't believe it has anything to do with it. Well, well, what you could do is just dig it up. I'm sure there is some insurance claim that would... Well, we, I mean, we have his family, and we have police that say we've debunked that theory that we've we have investigated that theory and his family is saying we are satisfied with the results of that investigation okay. and his family is the one that's saying that we believe that foul play is responsible for him not coming home mm -hmm. so I, I don't know that we can say that it wasn't dug up or that certain tests weren't conducted to confirm that there's no body or bones underneath that right, right, right. that cement so that that very likely could have been done i mean you have the loudest voices for foul play is his mother and his family. And they're the ones that saying are saying that we're satisfied with the result of that investigation. We don't believe that to be a possibility any longer after the information we have been told or seen or whatever. We should point out though, a counter argument to Bailey's family being responsible for his disappearance would be, what would the motive be? Right. Other than anger in this argument, because there's no life insurance policy. He was chance was the sole breadwinner, uh, the sole provider for his family. So his wife and son need him alive. Yeah. Well, think about this. We get in an argument because we want you to move to this state so you can make more money to benefit your family. Uh, you don't like that idea. So then we kill you because that obviously would benefit your family. It, I th but, but I think you have that reversed where they were living. The minimum wage wasn't the same as where they were visiting. And what Bailey is saying by the standards where we live, he's making good money. That's why she's saying that she believes that he misunderstood a comment or something that was said to him. We want you to do the best you can for your family, right? That was their point. And then he was mad about it. So, so then they kill him <laughs> like the, the motive doesn't make a lot of sense there. But again, I think if, if I'm the investigator, I'm, I'm looking into that actual golf outing. Did it actually happen? Did the argument actually happen? What was the ar argument actually about? Um, now I know that there's been multiple polygraph tests done in this case. It's just not clear on who those were for. And it, it seems to me the way it's implied is that Bailey has never taken one. Right. And again, th there's all kinds of problems with, with polygraph tests and results. Another possibility that we wanted to explore today too, Captain, was maybe he took off. Maybe he wanted to start a new life somewhere. That theory is often discussed in missing persons cases. The theory that he deliberately left and is living his life somewhere else. In the vast majority of cases, we dismiss this theory, and for good reason. There's just nothing to back it up in most cases. And it also seems unlikely 
given the circumstances, again, in most cases. But I will say here, in this case, I see it a little differently. I see a situation in Chance's case that it might be more of a possibility than it would be in most cases, because it's pretty clear from everything that I've reviewed that there's there's some drama in this young man's life. His family and Bailey's family, they're not getting along. They're not very friendly with each other. When he disappeared, Bailey didn't call his parents until the neighbor calls her. So she's not getting along with his parents. And then we have Dawn, his mother's own words to Matt saying, well, we'll try to reach out to him, but we don't think he'll want to talk to us. Even though he needs something, even though he is in the, he needs something. He needs a ride. He needs some help. He needs someone to pick him up and bring him home. We don't think he'll talk to us. So there's something going on in that relationship. I get it. You know, maybe between the stress of new wife, new baby, new house, new job, just lost my old job that I thought maybe would be my career. I don't really get along with my family. And if I stick around and try to love my son and raise my son, I'm going to constantly have to deal with her and her family. From what I've reviewed, Captain, there's not been his disappearance hasn't brought these two families closer. It doesn't sound like grandparents on on Chance's side have seen much of their grandson Banks since he went missing. Which, which is sad because the the, the baby's the Banks' father went missing. It takes a village anyways, and now this baby doesn't have his father. Don't don't keep um his family from this child. They 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 love this child. They want to help uh raise this child. They want to see this child do good in the world. But I'm going to defend Bailey for a second because we don't know what has been said to her or the actions that have been done to her since this. And if you feel like what I'm saying is don't use the kid as a pawn. Um, but at the same time, like if these people were making threats or you have, uh, you fear for your safety for some reason or fear for your child's safety, then, then I, I understand why you want to keep your distance. And to be clear, it is all perspective, right? I'm just simply saying in this situation, I see a higher probability for reasons that chance might go off and start a new life than I have seen in other cases that we have reviewed. And I say that here just because, again, it comes down to perspective. We don't know what his perspective was on his life and his relationships at that time. But from the outside looking in, you know, it's pretty easy to walk away when you don't feel like you're walking away from much of anything at all. And so I think that there's a higher probability for that in this case than would be in most cases. Now, The counter argument to that would be his words to his friend. When he calls Matt Miller, he has a plan. He says, I'm walking to this destination, 35 miles north of me, closer to my home, 35 miles closer to my home. I need a ride for someone to come pick me up and take me to my home. That seems to be a clear thought out. Well, who knows how well thought out but at least the plan for chance that night. He didn't call Matt saying F everybody. I'm out of here. No, he said, I need to get back home. And we know that he did not get back home. We know that nobody successfully picked him up. If they did, nobody's talking about it and there's no surveillance footage of it or no witnesses to it. So it seems to me like for him to have gone off and started a new life elsewhere and to walk away from his old life, Something had to change inside of Chance after that 7.46 p.m. phone call that night to Matt Miller. If that doesn't change, then he should have ended up back home, and that means something bad happened to him after that call. Obviously, there's no conclusion in this case at this time, but uh, what are your final thoughts? This case reminds me quite a bit of the Tyler Davis case. Episodes 296 and 297 on your True Crime Garage dial. In that case, Tyler was out with his wife and a friend and something happened. Some kind of argument took place and he decided he was going to go for a walk and never came back. And we have no trace of Tyler and no one knows what happened to him. And here we have a very similar situation or from what we're being told. 
Chance gets into some kind of argument. I believe he was arguing with more than just his brother-in-law. I believe that he was probably arguing with most of Bailey's family that was at the golf course. I believe he was arguing quite a bit with Bailey during that 20 minute car ride back to the grandparents house. And he goes off walking because he's upset. He's angry. He feels like he's been mistreated and it doesn't sound to me like he was going to go and just walk it off. He was going to go home. He was going to go back to his home. Now, what was going to take place in after that in his mind? No one knows. I cannot say that, but the thing that I cannot get past is I feel like the timing of the storm and the last contact with chance is not a coincidence as unlikely as it seems something must have happened to chance in the elements and his body is just not where authorities have expected it to be. Who knows how accurate the cell phone information is. We've seen them waffle on that a little bit or how lost and disoriented chase could have become during his travels that night, or if his phone died and he actually traveled miles from where he was last believed to have been. I think there's just a big mystery here, Captain, and I I wish Chance's family and Bailey's family nothing but the best and nothing but good luck in this situation and their continued search for Chance. We've seen Brandon Lawson uh, believe that, that we may have some some answers finally in his case. So you can hold out hope. I think that it looks a little bleak, obviously, given that he's been gone for so long, but maybe they'll get their answers and hopefully they get them soon. Thank you so much for joining us here in the garage. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading? This week, we are very happy to be recommending The Escape of Jack the Ripper, The Truth About the Cover-Up and His Flight from Justice by Jonathan Hainsworth and Christine ward Aegis. Look, everybody's always wondered for over 100 years now, who is Jack the Ripper? And these wonderful authors are here to tell you that he was young, handsome, highly educated, in the best English schools, a respected professional, and even a first-class amateur athlete. Read this book. They are going to tell you who Jack the Ripper was. This is called The Escape of Jack the Ripper, The Truth About the Cover-Up and His Flight from Justice. You can find that great title and many more recommendations on our recommended page at truecrimegarage.com. Much love to you all. Thanks so much for the support. We would be nothing without you. Until next week, be good, be kind, and don't let it.